We're all endlessly looking for reality, even when we try not to or think we aren't. This applies particularly, of course, to poets, artists, mystics, even in their own way to philosophers and scientists. Though we pursue fantasy, never more so than today, the soul's only true sustenance is reality, which even in the most adverse circumstances it somehow finds as a seed falling on a rock face somehow finds the tiny crack where it can grow. Of no English poet and artist is this more true than of William Blake. Born as the Renaissance world was coming to an end, he was profoundly distrustful of the intellect as a means of finding truth and of science as a means of exploring it. Though he was the first and perhaps the greatest romantic poet, he lived to abominate the spirit of romanticism and all the license and disorder it involved. My flesh is a prison, my bones the bars of death. What is mortality but the things relating to the body which dies? What is immortality but the things relating to the spirit which lives eternally? What is the joy of heaven but improvement of the things of the spirit? What are the pains of hell but ignorance, bodily lust, idleness and devastation of the things of the spirit? The imagination is not a state, it's the human existence itself. It was this spiritual reality that Blake painted in his pictures and wrote about in his poetic compositions. He had no use for any other kind of reality, to the point that he could never bear to paint from what is called life as expressed in flesh or substance or time, but only its inward reality or truth. The camera, representing the opposite principle, would have been anathema to him. Indeed, in my opinion, in a sense, he prophesied its coming and pointed to its dangers when he wrote of how we ever must believe a lie when we see with, not through the eye. The warning has passed unnoticed. And oh, what a multitude and diversity of lies having consequence come to be believed in. As I believed myself with the most profound conviction that Blake was right and that the only reality in life has been from the beginning of time and will be till the end of time, a spiritual one, called God. His work is, to me, one of the great expressions of sanity that exist. Nor does it in the least surprise me that for this very reason he was in his time considered mad, and would today certainly be subjected to psychiatric treatment with a view to drugging or psychoanalyzing and shocking him back into what passes for being sanity. 
the faculty whereby Blake saw into the reality of things, he called the imagination. And this is what he remained true to from the beginning to the end, despite neglect, failure, penury, other earthly ills that might well have deflected him from his central purpose. My mother groaned, my father wept. Into the dangerous world I leapt, helpless, naked, piping loud like a fiend hid in a cloud. This was Blake's way of saying he was born, actually on the 28th of November, 1757, the third son of a London hosier, and christened William at this church, St. James's Piccadilly. Receive this child into the congregation of Christ's flock and assign him with the sign of the cross interpreted hereafter. From the beginning, Blake was aware of good and evil as the two poles between which the current of life passes, generating the divine spark which exists in everyone. Every night and every morn, some to misery are born. Every morn and every night, some are born to sweet delight. Some are born to sweet delight, some are born to endless night. Like the medieval artists, Blake personified good and evil as good and bad angels, not so much opposed to one another as complementary. Blake instinctively rebelled against all forms of earthly authority, parental or ecclesiastical. Nonetheless, it was from the established Anglican Church that he derived much of his imagery, though for a time with the additional somewhat eccentric influence of Swedenborg, to whose teaching his parents adhered. Blake's parents were in modest circumstances, and there would have been no possibility of his setting up as an artist like, say, Sir Joshua Reynolds, one of his favourite butts. So he was apprenticed to an engraver, an excellent discipline for someone as ebulliently creative as Blake. It gave him a lifelong respect for fine drawing. As he put it himself in the light of his experience as an engraver, the great and golden rule of art as well as of life is this, that the more distinct, sharp and wiry the bounding line, the more perfect the work of art, and the less keen and sharp the greater is the evidence of weak imitation, plagiarism and bungling. What is it that distinguishes honesty from knavery but the hard line of rectitude and certainty in the actions and intentions? Leave out this line and you leave out life itself. All is chaos again, and the line of the Almighty must be drawn out upon it before man or beast can exist. By good fortune, he was sent to copy figures in Westminster Abbey, a wonderful opportunity to develop his burgeoning genius at a time when there were none of the public galleries, collections and reproductions of the great masterpieces available for students today.
We can easily imagine the young Blake here, a red-haired boy, spending his days in blissful absorption, breathing in history in the very air, seeing it all around him, written in monuments, some of which it was his business to study and to draw. Sometimes, in his eagerness, climbing up on top of them so that he could look down as well as up at their Gothic splendor. How incomparably more stimulating for him than helping his master, Bazir, with his engraving. Bazir, as a matter of fact, deserves a word of gratitude for having realized that with this particular apprentice, the only thing to do was to set him free with pencil and paper to follow his own fancies. And here was a perfect place for the purpose. For the Abbey had not yet become a tourist shrine for staring rather than for kneeling. For the young Blake, it was a place of worship, a house of God. Because of this, he was never alone here, even when he was alone. As later in his life he was fond of recounting, while he was working in the Abbey, he saw Christ and his apostles at the altar and a great procession of monks and priests, choristers and censer bearers, and heard them chanting. From these early days in the Abbey to the very end of his life when he lay dying and burst out singing of the things he saw in heaven, Blake was essentially and in all matters a religious man. I define this as meaning someone who, as Blake put it himself, has the capacity to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand an eternity in an hour. He was also, what's often overlooked nowadays, a Christian, even though he said and wrote things calculated to outrage and disconcert fellow Christians. For instance, priests and morality seemed to him the enemies rather than the promoters of true worship and virtue. And in the notion of the marriage of heaven and hell, angels and devils are liable to change places, and a Jehovah-like God to seem the enemy rather than the father of a beatific Jesus. Yet who's more beautifully stated the basic Christian need for the destruction of the ego and the joy and liberation its subjection brings? He who bends to himself in joy does the winged life destroy.
but he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. Again and again, and especially towards the end of his life, Blake sees in the Lamb of God the only true salvation for mankind and in their subduing of their fleshly passions, rooting up the infernal grove, their only true freedom. To see in this world the ultimate of heaven, he insists, is the most damnable falsehood of Satan and his antichrist. There's one of his poems, somewhat mysterious, like so much of what he writes, that yet to me seems to express most perfectly the faith of this extraordinary man. I'll read it. What air is born of mortal birth must be consumed with the earth to rise from generation free. Then what have I to do with thee? The sexes sprung from shame and pride, blowed in the morn and evening died. But mercy changed death into sleep. The sexes rose to work and weep. Thou, mother of my mortal part, with cruelty didst mould my heart. And with false self-deceiving tears didst bind my nostrils, eyes and ears. Didst close my tongue in senseless clay, and me to mortal life betray. The death of Jesus set me free. Then what have I to do with thee? Setting up on his own as an engraver in London, Blake, of course, wasn't always able to choose his subjects, but had to take on such commissions as came his way, rather in the same way that a freelance commercial photographer must today. Thus we find him engraving advertisements, cartoons, the then equivalent of travel brochures, drawings of social comment, for instance, relating to the explosive subject of slavery. work which he must often have found distasteful and have pined to live wholly in the golden glory of his imagination. Even so, it enabled him to make the acquaintance of many of his fellow artists, some of whom, like Flaxman, became lifelong friends.
One of the great blessings of his life was his marriage to his wife Catherine, the daughter of a market gardener whom he met on the rebound from another courtship and to whom he told his woes. Her sympathy was so lively that he fell in love with her on the spot. She later recalled that when she first set eyes on Blake, the conviction that this was the man she must marry so overwhelmed her that she nearly fainted. Her intuition proved correct. It was just about, just under two centuries ago, that Blake and Catherine Butcher were married in this Battersea Parish Church. As was quite common at that time, and the way things are going is likely to be quite common again, Catherine was illiterate, and so she signed her name in the register with a cross. In the course of their long and happy marriage, Blake taught Catherine to read and write, and also to draw and become a skilled engraver. From contemporary accounts and from Blake's own drawings of her, it appears that she was a woman of very considerable beauty, with large, dark eyes, and a face with a great deal of character in it. They first set up a house together in Green Street, in what's now Leicester Square. They were poor then, and they remained poor all their lives, so she had to be a very careful housewife. If Blake, in the course of his marriage, went through moods in which he felt that marriage itself was a kind of bondage, it's only what's happened to everybody who's ever been married, whether wife or husband. What's absolutely certain is that their union grew deeper with the years, becoming an integral part of Blake's visions and sense of eternity. As he came to see very clearly, and is certainly my own view and experience, marriage is only possible in a continuing human relationship when it's directed in the first place towards the procreation of children and finds in its ultimate fulfillment a spiritual union of which the bodily one is but a premonition. As Dunn put it, love's mysteries in souls do grow, and yet the body is his book. Blake's marriage, as it happens, was not blessed with children, which cannot but have been a sore disappointment to him, since as his songs of innocence so enchantingly show, he understood children wonderfully and loved them dearly. Indeed, they crop up as themes throughout his work. Catherine's love and devotion were wonderful and beautiful. She would, Gilchrist tells us, get up in the night when he was under his very fierce inspirations, which were as if they would have torn him asunder, sitting there motionless and silent to stay him mentally without moving hand or foot, this for hours and night after night. Everyone who, like Blake, has a passion for goodness cannot but in some degree hate morality, just as lovers of freedom hate law and lovers of truth hate dogma. There are many brilliant phrases and lines in Blake's writing in this sense. For instance, I went to the Garden of Love and saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut, and thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the Garden of Love that so many sweet flowers bore. And I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be. And priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. Or among the proverbs of hell. And remember, they are of hell. Energy, he writes, is the only life and is from the body. Those who restrain desire do so because theirs is weak enough to be restrained. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. On the strength of such observations of these, Blake has been taken as a sort of patron saint of permissiveness. Nothing could be more false. He saw as clearly as anyone who ever lived 
that to abandon himself to his sensual appetites was to cut himself off irretrievably from his visions. Till I turn from female love and root up the infernal grove, I shall never worthy be to step into eternity. The truth is that in our imperfect mortal existence, morality is a condition of goodness, as law is of freedom, and as dogma has been of the survival of our Christian faith. London was Blake's world. How often, pacing its streets, I found his words echoing in my mind. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse, blasts the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Though Blake belonged in time to the 18th century, he foresaw with remarkable prescience the industrial revolution that lay ahead and how inimical it would prove to the life of the imagination that he so prized. Already in his lifetime, the machine was destroying craftsmen, not just engravers like himself, but all who exercised such skills and crafts. On the title page of Bacon's Essays, Blake, Blake scribbled by way of comment, good advice for Satan's kingdom. I liked it very much. Heaven knows what he'd have written on other works in the same vein, like Darwin's Origin of Species and Huxley's Science and Education. In that sense, it's rather curious to be talking about Blake in this temple dedicated to science rather like speaking about Wordsworth in a high-rise block of flats or about St. Francis of Assisi in a supermarket. The notion of progress and the perfectibility of man, as expressed by Shelley's father-in-law, Godwin, had no more ferocious opponent than Blake, who rightly saw in it all the dreadful potentialities of human arrogance and destructiveness whose fulfillment we've witnessed in our time. What some saw as the Enlightenment, Blake saw as a sort of a plague spreading over the Western world. He saw in Newton with his calipers, Newton, the father of modern physics, he saw in him the symbol of this age of human self-sufficiency to come, all of whose begetters were anathema to him. Mock on, mock on, Voltaire Rousseau. Mock on, mock on, tis all in vain. You throw the sand against the wind, and the wind blows it back again. In the most widely known of Blake's poems, that is, the lines included in the preface to his Milton, beginning, and did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green. The phrase dark satanic mills is generally taken as referring to the abominations of the Industrial Revolution, with the result 
that the poems become a sort of a political hymn to be used in the more solemn or revivalistic Labour Party occasions, like the funeral of a leader or the closing session of a party conference. Actually, of course, it was much more the loom of Locke that Blake had in mind than any Lancashire mill. His imagination told him that all evil things begin with lies and false teaching and lead to conflagration, conflict and despair. The feet that in his poem walked upon England's mountains green, the countenance divine that shone forth upon our clouded hills did not belong to Karl Marx, but to the risen Christ. At the same time, with his imaginative insight, Blake understood that the whole nature of man's productive processes of meeting his needs was changing. arts of life they changed into the arts of death in Albion. The hourglass condemned because its simple workmanship is like the workmanship of the ploughman and the water wheel that raises water into cisterns, broken and burned with fire because its workmanship was like the workmanship of the shepherd. And in their stead, intricate wheels invented, wheel without wheel, to perplex youth in their outgoing and to bind to labors in album of day and night the myriads of eternity, that they may grind and polish brass and iron hour after hour, laborious task, kept ignorant of its use, that they might spend the days of wisdom in sorrowful drudgery to obtain a scanty pittance of bread, in ignorance to view a small portion and think that all and call it demonstration, blind to all the simple rules of life. So, beginning with Bacon, a great transformation was taking place in the human condition. The machine, first seemingly a servant, would infallibly become a demonic master, poisoning our air, polluting our rivers and lakes, flattening out 
our landscape, destroying our handicraft and our art, and smothering the imagination whereby man's creativity could relate itself to God's. great upheavals of Blake's time, the American and the French Revolution, were part of the same apocalyptic vision and treated accordingly. The putting down of tyrants, the freeing of slaves, the exposing, the exposing of the moral Christian and his laws. To all this, Blake exuberantly responded. But then, all that happened was that Caesar's poisoned crown was seen just to adorn another brow. The hand of vengeance found the bed to which the purple tyrant fled. The iron hand crushed the tyrant's head and became a tyrant in his stead. In the end, Blake came to see that the only true freedom is spiritual, achieved through the imagination. And the notion of progress in the world of space and time, an illusion that beguiles mankind with false hopes. In his prophetic books, so difficult to understand, and yet with a glowing core of meaning, he conveyed his sense of the doom that would befall men if they came to believe they could shape and dominate their own destiny. Their god, Urizen, is seen as drowning in the waters of materialism. Today, Blake, if he's in a position to observe the contemporary scene, will see Western man likewise drowning in his own affluence. For one short period in his life, Blake did move out of London and into the country on the persuasion of his friend and patron, William Haley, who provided him with a picturesque little cottage near the sea at Felpen in Sussex. In the long run, the arrangement didn't work and resulted in bitter reproaches and quarrels. Haley quite failed to appreciate the quality of Blake's work, and Blake found Haley's requirements a tedious servitude. It was during this period that Blake was arrested on a trumped-up charge of sedition, an experience that preyed upon him to an abnormal degree and left its mark in his prophetic books. Even so, his sojourn at Felpham gave Blake some enchanted moments reviving in him the mood of his exquisite songs of innocence. Piping down the valleys wild, piping songs of pleasant glee, on a cloud I saw a child, and he laughing said to me, pipe a song about a lamb, so I piped with merry cheer. Piper, pipe that song again, so I piped, he wept to hear. Drop thy pipe, thy happy pipe, sing thy songs of happy cheer. So I sung the same again, while he wept with joy to hear. Piper, sit thee down and write in a book that all may read. So he vanished from my sight, and I plucked a hollow reed. And I made a rural pen, and I stained the water clear. And I wrote my happy songs, every child may joy to hear.
Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life, and bid thee feed By the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, Soft as clothing, woolly, bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, Making all the vales rejoice. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, For he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I a child and thou a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. The sun does arise and make happy the skies. The merry bells ring to welcome the spring. The skylark and thrush, the birds of the bush, sing louder around to the bell's cheerful sound, while our sports shall be seen on the echoing green. Old John, with white hair, does laugh away care, sitting under the oak among the old folk. They laugh at our play, and soon they all say, such, such were the joys when we all, girls and boys, in our youth time were seen on the echoing green. Such moments, like childhood itself, couldn't last. After innocence comes experience, when the flowers and the fragrance give place to the tiger's fearful symmetry, and nightmare figures lie in wait in the forests of the night. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Blake returned to London more than ever feeling that he was an Ishmael, as he put it, born with a different face. Misfortunes often brought on by his own odd disposition and whimsical ways multiplied, and made him at times feel that he was the particular target of the world's buffetings. Yet he managed to avoid the self-pity to which his contemporary Rousseau was so given. Rather, he saw himself as Job, the subject of one of his greatest masterpieces. Like Job, he accepted God's chastisement as something to be endured that would in the end purify and enlighten him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. So, ever cheerful, Never lacking friends, Blake continued to the end, looking assiduously into the mystery of things, thereby providing unique illumination for generations to come. I must confess that when I first saw this life mask of Blake, and that was quite a number of years ago, I was disappointed a little and surprised. It didn't seem to me like the face of a poet and visionary. Much more like a man of action, I thought. And as a matter of fact, it by no means tallies with contemporary descriptions of Blake. For instance, one by the friend of his later years, Crabbe Robinson, who said that at 68, he had a large, pale face, a full, 
dark eye, a benign expression. At the same time, an air of languor, except when he was excited. And then he seemed full of inspiration. Even so, I think there's a lot to be learnt about Blake from the life mask. The toughness and severity and tension it shows are the intimations of a life that was full of worldly hardship and disappointments, but elevated and illumined by the joy and lovingness and beauty which his eye of the imagination saw all creation to be overflowing with. Joy and woe woven fine, a clothing for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine runs a joy with silken twine. It is right it should be so. Man was made for joy and woe. And when this we rightly know, through the world we safely go. So Blake expressed it. And there are few lines I've said over to myself more often than these, always deriving comfort from. Because Blake's reputation for eccentricity, if not madness, was much promoted by the casual, matter-of-fact way he spoke about his encounters with spirits from the past. Thus he'd say, as though it was the most natural thing in the world, that he'd been chatting with Socrates or Milton. When Crabb Robinson asked him what language he talked with Voltaire in, he answered, to my sensations it was English. It was like the touch of a musical key he touched it, probably French, but to my ear, it became English. It was a shrewd answer, as a matter of fact. You know, it's an illusion to suppose that those who look into eternity are simpletons when the children of time seek to trip them up. The Pharisees discovered this. Quite often, Blake made drawings of his spiritual visitors. These are the famous visionary heads, at which he'd sometimes work all night long. Various of his friends have left accounts of him thus engaged, seating with his paints and looking intently at a, to them, invisible model. Once, when he was working on William Wallace, he had to break off because he said Edward I had stepped in between him and me. He thereupon polished off the king before returning to Wallace. On another occasion, he told a visitor he had a great rarity to show him. This turned out to be a naked figure with a strong body and short neck, with burning eyes which long for moisture, and a face worthy of a murderer holding a bloody cup in its clawed hands out of which it seems eager to drink. But what in the world is it, his visitor asked. It's a ghost, Sir Blake replied. The ghost of a flea, a spiritualization of the thing. <laughs> Was all this then just hallucinations? Was Blake in this sense mad? There were some who thought so, while recognising the high quality of his work. For instance, Wordsworth, Hazlitt and Lamb. Others, like the young friends and admirers who gathered round him at the end of his life, Palmer and Linnell, were convinced of his sanity. Of all men whom I ever knew, Palmer writes, he was the most practically stained, steady, frugal and industrious. I personally inclined to Palmer's view. In a materialist age like ours, nothing is real except what's false. People, for instance, believe in money, but not in God. Whereas man is a fantasy, but God is the living truth. When the disciples saw Jesus after his resurrection, his presence was more real to them than it had been during his lifetime. So real that they founded a religion on it, which has lasted for 2,000 years. Similarly with Blake's spiritual visitants. Even someone as spiritually obtuse as I am has seen in a face full of goodness, say a Mother Teresa's, a beauty far more dazzling and memorable than any the flesh can show. Seek love in the pity of others' woe, in the gentle relief of another's care, in the darkness of night and the winter's snow, 
in the naked and outcast. Seek love there. Mad, I should say sane, to the point of sublimity. Blake's worldly circumstances didn't improve for the years. He grew poorer and poorer, and professionally speaking, was almost totally forgotten. The little bedroom he worked in, looking onto the river and just a few yards away from the noisy strand, Crab Robinson describes as squalid and poverty-stricken. Nonetheless, Blake received him there as though it had been a palace Blake's wife, Catherine, he goes on, seemed to be the very woman to make him happy. She'd been formed by him, Crab Robinson said. Indeed, otherwise, she couldn't have lived with him. Through these years of poverty and neglect, Blake only grew more serene. No one need doubt his sincerity when he offered prayers of thankfulness to God that riches and fame had not come to him to blur, distort, and obscure his visions. On the day of his death, which was August the 12th, 1827, about three months before his 70th birthday, he lay in bed, a friend who was with him recalls, singing songs so divinely, so beautifully, that Catherine got up to listen better. And then he turned to her and said, they're not mine, you know, and repeated it more emphatically. They're not mine. Then he went on to tell her that they would never be parted and that after he was dead, he would continue to watch over her, just as he had during the years of their long companionship. Blake had said before that death to him was no more than moving from one room to another. And, and so it proved to be. He went on singing in his bed in the same divine way until about six in the evening. And then, silently, invisibly, as he said in one of his poems, human love should be sought, his spirit left him, becoming part of the eternity on which his eyes had been so faithfully set during his mortal years. A neighbour who'd come in to sit with Mrs. Blake, a, a simple person, said that they'd been present at the death, not of a man, but of an angel. And I agree. <laughs>